All right, so why, re why React? So we're gonna have a quick little kind of about React. So uh, it makes building UIs easy. That's kind of stolen from their, 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 their website. And it's a versatile and unopinionated library. Uh, so some of the benefits, so what makes it easy is you have this thing called JSX, which is uh, something that people either love or hate or grow to love. Uh, it has a virtual DOM, which it uses for performance reasons, and it's, it's one of the magic things that happens under the hood that makes React um, a, a possibility. And it has a really small a API. And so that's going to become key in this um, coding that we're going to do because, again, I really don't have a whole lot to show you because there's only like a limited, like React itself is very limited in, in its part. Um, some of the other ben benefits is it has a vibrant ecosystem, so there's almost a component for pretty much anything you'd ever want. Um, you, you could find a component, like if you need a video player, if you need a background video, if you need any of this stuff, if you need Facebook sharing buttons, and social sharing buttons, like these things all exist and you just pull them in as components and use them. Uh, it has a, a community that's building and improving and experimenting, so this is, um, to me, this is something that I really like. I like that the React com community is constantly trying to make what they do better or trying to challenge the way that they do things now to find even better ways to do stuff. Um, and, and we're getting to a point now where we have some proven um, but maybe still evolving patterns. Uh, and in the advanced React course, we're gonna talk about some of those patterns. But uh, over time now, we've had React long enough that we've started to kind of get an idea of um, what are some of the ways you can build components? What are some ways you can structure your application? And there's a lot of uh, be best practices that we can rely on because the community is constantly um, trying and making things better. So some of the learning curve, steep learning curve. Uh, so if you'll notice here, my drawbacks are almost exactly my benefits. Um, so I love that it has a small API and it's really, you know, what it does is very simple, but that's actually kind of a drawback because it really means that you have to understand JavaScript and you have to fill in a lot of blanks uh, when you're writing a JavaScript application. It, again, it's just a view layer essentially and it only handles a small part of an entire application. It's very different from something like, um, like Meteor or Angular where it's this entire framework and it has pretty much all the all the problems and all the solutions figured out for a complete application. Um, but yeah, it leaves a lot for you to do. Uh, and the ecosystem, so the ecosystem, I love the fact that we're experimenting, coming out with new stuff, really challenging the norms that we have. Um, but to some people, that can get old really quick. And so it, I think that's another kind of a love-hate kind of thing within the community. Uh, one of the cool things, at least I think it's cool, is. Um, um, React has really pushed forward this functional programming kind of concept in JavaScript. JavaScript has always really lended itself to being a functional or being written in a functional way, and React really start is really what introduced a lot of people to this kind of functional paradigm, uh, and you're going to kind of see some of that um, as we go through and start coding. So one of the things that you'll hear when people start talking about React and functional pro programming is embracing a declarative versus imperative style of programming. So at a high level, what you'll hear is um, declarative is um, what should this page look like? So when you write stuff in a declarative way, you're really saying this is what this should look like and you really don't get yourself involved too much in um, the details. So if, if you were in the first talk that I gave where I did the higher order component or functions and I did map, filter, and reduce, um, traditionally, if you wanted to do those things, you would have done a for loop, and you would have had to set a variable, and you would have had to increment the variable, and all this, you're doing all this busy work to make it loop an array. Um, so that would be an imperative, whereas um, using map, filter, and reduce is more of a declarative. You're not really telling it how to loop, you're just saying, hey, when you loop, do this. You know? So that's kind of the difference between imperative and declarative programming. And you'll see this in React as well. So the app that we're going to build, it's, a, it's um, a small little app. I have a vanilla JavaScript version that I'm gonna show you first and we're gonna kinda look at the code and then we're gonna re replicate that in React. And you'll kinda see that the uh, vanilla JavaScript version is much more imperative um, than declarative. And I always like to say that, and I don't know if I stole this or if this was, um, I may have stole this, I don't know. Uh, but uh, the page is a visual representation of the data, which is uh, once you get that into your head and you really start to think about um, thinking about um, at the end of the day it's just data and all your, all your view is is a visual representation of that data. So if the data changes, your view changes and you only have to do a little bit of work to make those changes happen. Once that starts to click, you'll really start to see the power that um, is React. 
All right, so these are some links um, that you can follow to. So I'm going to be using a thing called Code Sandbox today. It's, um, it's a way for us to code uh, React, Vue, vanilla JavaScript. They have, you can code in anything you want uh, for JavaScript, and it has an editor, and um, it has live reloading and all this cool stuff. That, that's what we're going to utilize today when we're doing the live coding. So if you go to the first link, Code Sandbox, you're going to see a list of all kinds of sandboxes that I've created. Um, some of them were the jQuery from before. Uh, what we're going to build today will be on there once it's completed. Right now it's empty. Um, and there are some other ones for the other talks, and just some, some really cool sandboxes that could be useful um, to look at. Because what you're going to want to do with all of this stuff, once you see me kind of build it out, is you're really going to want to get in there, get your hands dirty, start breaking stuff, moving stuff around, and really trying to understand how it works. And I think it's really cool that you're going to be able to take something I make and just start to use it. And what's also really cool about it is that we don't have to worry about installing any type of third-party packages or worrying about if, whether you have Node or NPM or any of these things installed on your local computer. You can get coding right away. Now, specifically, we're going to go to the Intro to React example. That's going to be the one that we're going to be coding right now. And I'm going to set down for this. All right, so here's the vanilla JavaScript version of what we're going to build. Um, it's, it's kind of a to-do app, except you can't check stuff off. All you can do is delete stuff. So it's, it's uh, 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 Correct. Uh, we're going to code that out here in a second. That's where I need your, that's where I need your prayers and wishes that um, it really goes well, because it's an empty file. Thank you. Um, Okay, so here is the, here's, here's a vanilla example of what we do, or what we're going to build. So pretty much you can add to-dos and you can remove them. And that's really all this thing does, right? So you can just add stuff. Um, so let's kind of look at the code. Uh, so if we go down to line six here, this register to-do list, um, what you'll see is I've defined a function. And then afterwards, um, I initialize that function. So this is just kind of a pattern I use when I'm writing vanilla JavaScript. And so what generally happens is, is this code would be in a separate file within my project, and I'll export this register to do function, and then in my index.js, which is like the root of my entire project, I'll be pulling all of these little files in using the imports and exports from the previous class. So what I'll do is I'll have a file, I'll define this function, export it, and then in index.js, I'll import it, and then I'll call it. And other than just kind of separating your code and making it easier to kind of figure out where things are, uh, one of the things I like to do, with, or one of the reasons I like to do this with a function is that I can go and get like the core element that I need for whatever it is I'm building. Generally, whenever you're coding something, there's like a root element that you need, or else if you don't have that, it's not going to work. And I like to just do this bail early kind of concept where um, the function will go try and find that element, and if it doesn't find it, it just returns false or returns and gets out of there, and it never executes the rest of this code. And this is really useful when you're working with traditional websites and vanilla JavaScript, where certain functionality and elements may only exist on certain pages. With this kind of approach, you don't have to worry about, well, what page am I on, and does, you know, does this thing exist? This is a quick way to be like, only run this code when these elements exist. Otherwise, just don't do anything. All right, so what I'm doing next is I'm going to go and grab a bunch of elements. So I'm getting the list itself, which is a UL. I'm getting this input field and I'm getting this button. So I'm using um, vanilla JavaScript to go and query the document and find those. Um, then the next thing I do is I do button, and I do add event listener. So this is how you would you know, register an event. It's a click event. Uh, I get an event. I prevent the default. And the reason I do that is because if you click the button, uh, traditionally, it's just going to reload the page. Uh, then what I do is I create an item. And so the way that I'm doing this here is like, uh, I call these poor, poor man's templates. So I use template literals, which is a new ES6 kind of thing, where I can say, here's the HTML of this item, and then I'm going to insert the text of the item. Uh, and then I have to do this weird thing where I use these fragments and kind of convert this string into actual HTML, so that uh, down here, this actually ends up being a node element, an actual HTML element, and I can call a pen child. Otherwise, if I didn't tell it to do that, it would give me an error saying that item is not an, an, a node element. And then I have to go and remind it to go put the input field back to empty so that um, it is ready for the next item that I input. 
And then uh, to remove the stuff, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to the, on the unordered list, I'm going to listen to any click events on it. Um, and then I'm going to check right here to see if the event target.tagName equals button, because that means they actually clicked the button. Because since I'm registering this event on the entire UL, anytime they click on the UL, an LI, a button, any of those all fire this event. And I only ever want to call this removing logic uh, when, I'm, when it's actually clicked on a button. Uh, so once I know I'm, someone clicked on a button, the button that got clicked is what's, called, is what's in event.target, and I use you know, JavaScript closest to move up the tree to find its closest parent li, and that's, that's how I know which li I need to remove based on which button gets clicked. And then I call list.removeChild to remove that element. So again, it's, um, I'm very much in the weeds here telling it step by step how to do every single thing um, throughout the whole entire application. Now granted, it's not a lot of code, and I believe uh, when we do the React version, it, it'll, it's more code overall, but I think um, Logically and mentally, it'll be easier over time as you get m more comfortable using React. Um, it'll make more sense and it'll be easier to reason about your application than here. Here you have to do a lot of reading of code to really understand what's going on with React. It'll become easier to really kind of at a glance know what's going on. All right, so let's get started. So at the end of the day, what, what React is doing is it ha it's going to be, you're going to be creating components. But at, what happens is, is those components eventually get converted into creating HTML via JavaScript. And, to be honest, and believe it or not, you can already create HTML via JavaScript if you want. And so that's where we're going to start. The first thing we're going to do is show you how you could uh, create some HTML with JavaScript, uh, tr even without React. And then we're going to start to slowly move our way into the world of React. So if we look at the HTML file that gets loaded for this site, uh, you'll see that there is a div with an ID of root, and that's really all that's in here. Uh, and that's how React will work. So React is injecting the entire contents of your application into this one div, and, and we're going to do the same thing right now even with vanilla JavaScript. All right, so the first thing I need to do is go get that root element. And then what I need to do is I need to create a new element. And the element that I want to create is an h1. So I'm using document.createElement. So this is a method that's built onto the document um, object in JavaScript. And then I'm going to add a bunch of stuff to it. So I'm going to add a class. I'm going to add a, some styles. And then most importantly, I'm going to tell this element what is in it using inner text. And then I'll take the root element that we found, that ID, that div that's on the page, and we're going to do a pen child, and we're going to pass it the element. And there you go. You can see I've rendered uh, an H1 on the page. It's text align centered. It has a font size. And I did that all just with vanilla JavaScript. And you can see if we do the console down here, you can see that the div with the ID of root now has an H1 in it, and it has a class of YOLO, and it has some inline styling added to it. So again, the whole, the whole what JavaScript does is it allows you to build an entire application, including HTML and everything, in purely JavaScript. Uh, what you'll notice here, though, is that who wants to do this? Not me. This is ridiculous. Uh, so let's, uh, let's try to do it with React. Now, what we're going to do first, though, is we're going to use um, kind of a low-level API that's built into React that uh, you're not actually going to use. But I just want to show you that there's this kind of wrapper around what we've seen here that's in React. And so we're going to do that now. So I need to import React for this to work. 
Uh, and one of the cool things about Code Sandbox is that it's already pulling these dependencies in and it has a build, so it's running Babel. Um, it has things like ESLint for linting and you're gonna see a lot of these errors coming up and they're, they're kind of helpful. Um, so I just wanna point out that, that there's an entire build application here and there's all kinds of stuff going on that we don't have to worry about. And so that's why I'm able to just go ahead and start importing React without actually you know, setting up a project. So similar to the document, we're gonna give it what we want it to be. Then we're gonna give it an empty object for now, and then we're gonna tell it what the text or what should be in it, what its children should be. And then in React, um, we have another thing called uh, React DOM. So in, the way React is built is that the core library of React is in a React package, and then the stuff that has to do with the web is in a package called React DOM. And then later today when we do the native stuff, you'll see that there's another package called React Native. So you have this DOM and native packages and they all kind of pull from the core uh, React. So whenever you're working with React, not only do you normally have to pull React in, but you also have to pull in this other thing. And for us, it's the DOM. Um, and so what we're gonna pull in is we're gonna pull in a method called render that's in that React DOM package. And again, these packages are in my node modules, if you could see my node modules. So these are packages that were installed um, using your modern JavaScript, and so that's why I have access to them. So I'm gonna use this render, and what you do is you pass it um, the root and then the element, I think, or maybe it's the other way around. There we go, other way around. And so now you can see that I have a hello world now this, this object that it gets passed, you can actually do a lot of stuff with this, and one of the things you can do is pass all the props, and you're gonna learn about props in a minute. And one of the things that we can pass, though, is a style um, object, and then we can do this kind of the same stuff we did before. And you'll see now we kind of have pretty much the same thing that we had uh, using the vanilla JavaScript. Um, and again, this right here is what's called the children. So one of the things I could do is I can make another component. I'm just gonna copy a lot of this. This one's gonna be a div. We're not gonna worry about this stuff. Uh, and what it's gonna get is it's actually gonna get the element as its child and then we're gonna render it out. So again, nothing has really changed visually, but if we inspect this, we'll see that we have our root element that we had before, now we have that new div, which is the wrapper, and then we have our H1 inside of it. And so this is kind of how under the hood React is converting your components into something very similar to vanilla JavaScript. Um, it's just, just a little bit better. And that's the big takeaway here is that no one, we still don't wanna do this, this sounds horrible. All right, so what, what we wanna do now is we actually want to start to use um, React's component um, classes to build out uh, components the way you normally would in React. And so let's, uh, let's convert what we have here to work with that. I love that it saves right away. That is so awesome. All right, so we're gonna create an app component. So this is what's, so this first kind of component you're gonna see, this is what's called a, a functional or stateless component. So this is a component that's really uh, built out as a function. So you can see this is, all this really is is an arrow function from uh, the modern JavaScript. So this is the first and simplest way to create a component, and it's the way that you're gonna to wanna to try and create as many components as you can, because they're also referred to as dumb components, because they literally take some data and they represent that data as HTML, and that's all they do is take data and represent it. Uh, and it'll make more sense in a minute, uh, but let's just go ahead and make this do something. All 
right? So that's our first component. It's, um, I think it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna win a lot of awards, for sure. Um, but yeah, so you can see, all I've really done is defined a function, and the reason this works is because I have React on the page, uh, and this right here is your first introduction to what's called JSX. So this is not HTML, it's a, it's a parser and kind of like a language in and of itself that's packaged into Word, or React. It's not even part of React, it's its own thing. Um, but what React does is it uses it to parse this and turn it into those other create elements that you saw before. So that's what it's doing under the hood, is it's converting this JSX into those create elements and rendering it all into the page. And uh, once you've created a component to, create, to actually show off, or to use the component, you use, you use this syntax right here, um, which also looks a bit like um, you know, closing HTML. And again, this render is just injecting this entire component into that root ID. Uh, and, one, and you can do things like styles. So um, we can pass this an object. Uh, so in, in, when you're doing JSX, you're gonna do stuff like this, and we're gonna do this kind of thing with props, but for right now, we're just using style. So style equals, and then you do square brackets, and then, or curly braces, and then inside of those curly braces, you wanna give it an object that represents what you want. So similar to what we did a minute ago. Right, so we're just passing in that, that style. And so, and when you see when I save there, that, so that's another thing called prettier. I, I don't know if any of you are using prettier with your coding. Uh, prettier simple, essentially just formats your code, uh, and it's really nice, and um, it's really made me, um, a very, I mean, I think developers are lazy anyway, but um, it makes it to where I just write whatever and hit save, and it makes it look good, right? So uh, if you're into laziness, get prettier. Also, too, if you're using ESLint, ESLint's gonna yell at you and throw you lots of errors, lots of really useful stuff. It's gonna help you catch a lot of things that probably would have been errors at runtime when you loaded the page. Um, and if you just have ESLint in there by itself, you're going to, you're going to be hating life because it's gonna be yelling at you all the time for every little thing. But when you use ESLint with Prettier, so long as um, you're using similar styling patterns because you can kind of mix, match, um, you can change the styling a bit. Uh, when you use Prettier and ESLint together, what's nice about that is Prettier fixes 99% of the stuff that ESLint would have yelled at you about doing, and it really only leaves ESLint to show you stuff that's really important. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna create a new component. So we're gonna start to actually implement our vanilla JavaScript thing that I showed you. Uh, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a component called list item. Uh, and it's going to be a stateless functional component. And we're gonna export, we're gonna use export default. So like this is gonna be the only thing that really gets exported from this file. So again, this is using a lot of the ES6 stuff um, and the modern JavaScript from the previous talk. And then we just want to return um, a list item And, and we're gonna use square or curly braces to inject in the text for this item, and this text is gonna come via what's called props. And so we're gonna talk about props um, in just a second. So this is our first component, and it just renders out an li. That's all it's going to do. So we're gonna go back over into our app. I'm gonna get rid of this. And we're gonna import this new component, list item, from dot slash list item. So again, using kind of imports and exports, so you'll see the difference here is that when I'm importing React and I'm re importing render, I just call the name directly and it works and that's because by default the import stuff that's built into modern JS knows to go look in node modules for those, whereas my own stuff I'll do, I have to actually map it to the path to where it's actually at. And since this file is in the exact same, you know, same level as the current file, I can just do dot forward slash and it'll pull it in. All right, now the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to convert this app component to be um, a stateful class-based component. So this is the second way that you can create a component. So we're gonna say class app extends component. And we actually have to import another thing. We have to import component. And then we need 
need to have a render method. That's an important, that's a requirement for a class-based component. And so there you go. So now I've, I've refactored that component from a functional component to a class-based component. And really the only thing that changed was that instead of it being a function, we're now extending a component class. And instead of just returning JSX, we have to have a render method, which then returns that JSX. So those are the two main differences um, at this point. There's, a, there's gonna be more differences and we're gonna be exposed to those as we keep building. All right, so, the, so now what I wanna do is I'm, I'm going to initialize an initial state for this component. This is another thing that makes uh, class-based components different than the stateless functional components. Uh, components like this cannot have any internal state, uh, whereas these, um, these can have their own internal state. And I'm gonna set a data property. And for right now, I'm just gonna make this uh, just a list of stuff. And then I'm gonna switch up what I'm returning here. And I'm gonna return a UL. And then I'm gonna create a new, um, I'm gonna create a new function or method on this class, and it's gonna call, be called render. It's gonna be called render list items. And then I'm gonna do what's called um, object destructuring, I think. So bad with names. But essentially, I'm gonna, this state object, this is, this is an object, right? This state thing is an object, and I can reference it within React using this.state. Um, but just because um, I wanna be too cool for school, um, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna say data equals this.state. So this is something you would have seen in the previous talk where I'm going to essentially pull this out of this.state, so out of the state, and now I have this new variable inside of this function called data, which is literally this. Now that's what I did. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return from this thing and I'm gonna map over the data, so I'm gonna loop over that data. So this is something, again, higher order functions from the first talk and I'm gonna use an arrow function from the second talk. So I'm gonna get an item and I'm gonna output um, a list item. So we got some work to do here, but I'm, I've, we pulled that component we made in, this one over here, and now we're going to loop over this array of data and for each item in the array, we're going to create an, an instance of this component, and we're going to pass this text in, so the item. And if we look over here, you can see that I'm, I'm destructuring or pulling this text thing out of the props that get passed. So what we're doing right here is passing props. So this right here, what you see here is me passing props, and the beauty with props is that this name text um, that's just what I called it. It could have been anything I wanted, and it's up to your imagination. Props can be anything you want, and you can pass anything you want as props to, the, to any of your components that you create. And in this instance, I'm, I'm passing um, a text prop, which is one of these items. And so over here, I pull that text thing out of what's called um, this.props. I'm pulling that out just so that I, instead of, I could just do this, this.props.text. But instead, I'm pulling it out, and I'm just, and I'm able to just call it text. So that's what you see me doing there. So one of the things I'd like to point out here too is that what I'm doing here, there's probably a lot simpler ways I could have even simplified this even more. Um, but I actually made the conscious decision to really show you how I actually would write React because, unfortunately, um, most people in React want to be too cool for school. And if you look at any documentation, this is what you're going to see. And so it's very important, I think, for you to just get get into doing this stuff now. Um, so the last thing we need, this is kind of a React kind of thing, is that anytime you're looping over a list of stuff and you're mapping things like this, you have to pass it a key, uh, and it needs to be something unique. Uh, so normally, like in WordPress, we would use probably like the post ID, but uh, I don't really have that right now, so I'm just gonna use the index, which is not preferred, but it'll work. So what's cool about map, I didn't cover this previously, is that not only do you really get the item, but you also get the index. It's just if you wanted to use that or not, it's up to you. And then lastly, we're going to use this function we, call, we made. Cool, 
So um, again, the render here is an unordered list, and then we use these curly braces to be able to, to run JavaScript. So in the render, we, whenever you want to run JavaScript, you'll use curly braces. And so all I'm doing here is I'm running this function, and again, this function goes and gets the state, maps over the state, and outputs a list item for each one of the items here. So I have a script, I'm just looking at it. All right, so I think that at this point what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, refactor this a little bit. So instead of having all of this logic kind of in our app, I'm gonna move this out into a separate component called list. And again, it's going to be a, it's still going to be a stateful component, so I'll say class list extends component. Uh, it's going to have a render. It's going to return something. Uh, and what it's going to return is it's going to return the same thing this was. And we're also going to just move uh, this part right here over. And uh, one of the things that we need to change is that the data is still going to live up here, and this is going to make a little more sense here in a little bit why the data is still up in this upper parent component. Uh, but the data is going to stay up here. Uh, so what we need to do in our list is instead of getting data from this dot state because it was internal to the state, it's going to get it as props. So if we just change this to props, um, it'll start to get it from props. And it's also going to need this list item because that's it's now the component that's rendering the list item. And then we're just going to import list from list. And then down here, that's not really what I wanted. And we're going to pass data. Supposed to be list. And it's also helpful if you export this thing so that you can actually access it. There we go. So I wrote a whole bunch of code and we did nothing. So congratulations. Um, that, that's refactoring. And so, and, and this is something I think a lot of developers do, right? You take baby steps, you make little incremental improvements. Um, so we refactored it out so that it's in a separate. Um, separate place. And so now what we want to do is we're going to add more to this. So we're going to create a div. And inside of that div, we're going to render out our list item. So again, nothing's really changed except now this stuff's in a, in a div. And the reason we're doing that is because we're going to create a form now. And uh, newer versions of React, you don't have to you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to wrap. You can't, in, in React, in the older versions of React, you couldn't have an, a, an H1 and an H2 or a, a two P tags on the same level as each other without a wrapping parent element. Uh, in newer versions of React, that's going away, but uh, currently Code Sandbox, that's, it still is using that, so I have to ensure that I wrap, uh, I, can't, I can't have a list and a form here. I'll have to wrap them with a div or else it wouldn't work. So we're gonna create a form. We're going to create an input. And then we're going to create a button. There 
we go. I was getting a little worried there for a second. I wrote a whole bunch of code and nothing showed up. Uh, cool, so I have a form. Uh, I can type stuff uh, in here and that works. Uh, and if I hit add, you'll see that it just reloads the page because that's kind of the default action for um, a form field. Okay, cool. So uh, we're actually going to start to do a, a lot of stuff that has to do with React. We're going to start to really learn a lot of, right now with adding a to-do, we're going to learn how to do a whole bunch of stuff that's really vital to understanding React. So uh, one of the things we need to do is we're going to do an on-click event. So in React, when you're in your JSX, you can just type something like that, on-click equals square brackets, and then give it a function to run. And so we're going to create a function called this dot handle uh, add item. Curly brackets. I keep saying square brackets. So sorry. Uh, so we're going to create this function. Uh, and it's going to get an event, just like, um, just like if you were registering DOM events uh, with jQuery or vanilla JavaScript, uh, this on click event, whenever someone clicks, is going to fire this function and it's going to pass this in the event. So I'm going to say event.preevent default. And I'm going to console log YOLO. And you can see it's working. And I'm not gonna lie, when I'm coding, I always do this. Even though I've registered a million events before I get in there and really start writing all kinds of logic and it not working, and then I get mad at myself, uh, it's always nice to just make sure that it at least will show something before you get into doing more. So what, what we wanna do now is we actually want to be able to get the value that's in the input, and we want to do what's called set state. We want to add an item to this array uh, in the state. Um, and there's a couple of ways to do this in React, but the preferred way that they want you to work with input fields is to make it what's called a controlled component. And what that means is, is that we, it wants us to register an on change event on the input and listen for every keystroke that happens and then update a value that's in our state. If that didn't make sense, it will here in a second. So we're gonna make a new value in our state called input value and make it set to em an empty thing. And then down here I'm gonna say value equals this dot state dot input value. And now I think this should be, oh, it still works. There we go. Now you see when I type now, it doesn't work. So I broke it, but that's kind of what we want. So what we want now is that we want these things to happen on change and we want these to be in our state. So we're gonna create a new function called handle input change. And I'm just making up these names, by the way. And um, it's gonna get an event. And we're gonna use something in React called set state. So this dot set state. And I'll explain this in just a second. So you can see I can type again. So what's happening here is that every time I, a keystroke happens, this on change function fires, which runs our function, and it gives us the event. And event.target, this is just like vanilla JavaScript, so this is again kind of like where you really need to know JavaScript. Uh, on any event, event.target is the element that had the event listener. So in our case, event.target is the input, and the input has a value, and we can get that value. So every keystroke, we're getting a value. So like right this second, value was FF. Okay, then we're gonna use um, part of the React API. This is, a, this is like one of the most important parts is like is this dot set state. So set state is how you um, handle updating this internal state in React. Uh, and by doing this, React is going to do all of the things that you hear about with the virtual DOM and diffing and figuring out what's going on. And it's gonna know how to render and what to render and what needs to get updated. So by setting, um, by doing this dot set state, we're slowly changing this value like this, right? And you can see that I actually updated over here. You see that? So again, just another little example of your, your view is a visual representation of your data. 
my data has an input value with all these weird letters, and now this thing does too. And as I change them over here, they change them over there, right? Um, so there, now, because we've done this, our input value is now being stored what we type. And what that means is down here in add item, we can, um, we can do this dot state as well. It's this dot set state. And here we can say data equals something. And here I'm going to do the destructuring again. So here I can say that data equals data dot concat, which is a, an array method. And I'm just going to put um, input value into an array and kind of push it into the array. It's kind of a way I cheat, I guess. And then an input value, I'm going to set back to the empty string. So let's see if this works. So you can see that when I added update step. So just again, uh, the input is using the on change, which is setting the input values value. And then whenever you hit the button on click, it runs this handle add item. And that's going to get an event. Um, and then what we can do there is we can then set state. And we can push a new item into this data array. So we're pushing our new item, whatever you type, into this array. And then we can also then reset this input value back to empty string so that it's empty and ready for the next thing. So if I refresh the page, they'll go away. Okay. Yeah. And um, later on today, when we get into much more advanced stuff, we normally won't actually have a, a, a data thing set. We'll be fetching it from like an API or something. Um, so this is more for instructional purposes, but yeah, if you just reset, it kind of loses its state, um, and then it'll start building the state up again. So the state's only as good as the browser that it's in, and as soon as that browser goes away or refreshes, it clears state and starts to fresh again. All right, so now we're going to build the remove functionality. Uh, the remove functionality is uh, a little bit more complicated, I'm not going to lie, uh, and it's going to start to show kind of... Um, one of the potential issues you can have with React as it starts to get bigger and, and your application starts to grow. So the first thing I need to do is I need to make a button. So you can see now that each of these things have a button. And um, what I have to do is I'm going to have to, what we want to do is um, on the button, we want to do on click. We want to run a function, right? And that function is going to go and update the data, the state. Uh, the problem is, is that our state is up here in our, in our main app component. So the way our React app is working right now is we have our main app component, then we have a list component, and then inside of that list component, we have the list items. And the list items is where the actual click event is going to happen from. So what we have to do right now is we actually have to pass a function down as props multiple levels. So you're going to see me doing this right now where um, I'm going to be passing this, this function now as props, and we'll get it to work. Uh, w one thing I didn't mention, too, uh, that's really important. So you can see here when I'm creating these functions how I am uh, using arrow functions right here. So the reason I'm doing that is because um, by default that, that does a binding of what's called this. Is the, if you've ever had trouble with JavaScript and this, um, that's why. It's because um, you're working with events, and that event, this, this, is different from the original this from where you thought the function was going to be. Um, if you don't care about any of that, just do error functions, and you don't have to worry about it. This will just always work. Okay? So that's the big takeaway. And that's why I'm, I'm making these all error functions. Because if I did make these error functions, this call to this.setState state would give me an error. Okay, so the list right here is going to get a new prop. I'm going to call it on remove. And I'm going to pass it the this dot handle remove item function equals. And then I need to go into my list, and I need to tell it that it's getting a on remove prop. And then I need to take this on remove prop, 
and I need to pass it down to my list item component. It's confusing, I'm not gonna lie. And that's why I'm really glad that you're gonna have the links to this so you can mess around with this and figure out why it's, how I did what I did. And then lastly, in here, we're going to get this on remove and uh, we're going to just pass it in here. So if I go all the way back up to where I define this stupid thing, uh, and I do this, Oh, it doesn't work. All right, let's figure out why. Handle remove item. This dot handle remove item on remove. This thing over here gets on remove. On remove equals on remove. Um, let's refresh the page. Let's just pray. Yes, there was no problem. All right, that's tedious, needless to say. Um, but it's manageable, especially for quite a while within an application. Um, so you can get really far with set state and having, and having what are called these container components. So our app right now is a container component. It contains a lot of the logic. It contains the data. And then we have a lot of these like, you know, not very smart components that really just handle rendering information. And what you're going to want to do is in your application, you're going to want to do that. And you're going to want to have a couple of these. So like you have a main app, and then you might have like two container components that have some logic about, say like this to-do might be like one container that does something. And say on the app we had another feature that did something else, that would have its container and its children. And so what you're going to want to do is start to build your application into where um, you have these little pockets of, of really intense logic and data. And um, that way when you're passing props, you're able to um, not have to pass stuff you know, too many levels deep. I hope so, if I, yeah. Yes, so this, this, I shared a link to this, it's in my slides. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. You're, you sh okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I shared a link, but if it didn't work, we'll figure it out for sure. Okay, so you guys are spying on me? That's so wrong. All right, so, so this is gonna get a little tricky. So what we wanna do is, uh, we've, we've at least wired it up, we can see the YOLO kinda working. So we know we've, we've passed this function down and it's doing what it's supposed to do, so that's a good sign. Now we can actually really work on the actual logic that's gonna remove an item from the array. Um, so, because our array is like a flat array here of just text, um, what we're going to try to do is we're going to use the index that it's in the array to figure out how to remove it. Um, if we were working with WordPress, this array would probably be an array of post objects, and those posts would have an ID, and it would be really easy to kind of like loop through this array and find the ID that was getting deleted. Um, but in our case, we're just going to use an index. Um, so, if we go over to our list, Um, you can see that we have an index here, and we passed it as a key. So what we're going to do is we're going to add one more prop called ind index. And we're just going to pass that index to the list item. Then we're going to go update our list item component uh, to get an index. And then what we're going to do is we're going to switch this up a little bit. So you can just pass the name of the function, and it'll execute the function. But you can also in here just do an anonymous function like this. With Gotta love arrow functions. Um, and you're gonna get an event. And then over here, you can call this function. And so I can pass the event. So, real quick, what you see there is the same as this. I didn't do anything different. But the reason I'm doing this, though, is because I want to pass another property, which is this index that I got. So, as I loop through and I build these list items, uh, using kind of closures and all that stuff we talked about in the first talk, it, it still knows about this index. It knows what number it was and it remembers it. And I'm able to pass that along to this on remove function so that it has the index. And so if I go over here to my um, remove item, 
and I updated it to get um, something, I'm just going to call it item index. This is the index. It's now going to get two items. Huh? Ah. Thank you. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to do this dot set state. And we're going to set some state. Uh, again, I'm going to do const data equals this dot state. And then inside of here, I can say data equals, and I'm, there's a lot of ways you could do this, probably better ways, but man, I just love looping and filtering. So uh, I'm going to get an item, and I'm just going to say that, um, and I'm going to get the index. Again, when you use map and filter, you usually just use the item and get the item, but it does pass you the index. And what that means is that we can just go and say, uh, so long as item index, so the index that got clicked, as long as that index isn't the current index I'm looping through, then return it. And what that means is that the index of the item I did click on gets removed from the array. Um, yeah. So you can see when I click item two, item one, it removes it from the array. And so what's happening, let's, we'll recap that because it's a bit convoluted. So when I, this item one, this button, it remembers that it was index zero. So when I click this button and this function fires, uh, this right here is zero. And then I go and loop through the array again. So the first time I loop through the first item I get to, this is zero. So the first item in the array is zero and the item that was clicked was zero. So since zero does equal zero, it doesn't get put into this new data. So that's essentially making this happen, where that it returns an entirely new array minus that one because those indexes matched. All right, so. All right, so that's the live coding part. It worked. So. Uh, just a few slides. Yeah, let me make sure. So I have a little bit more. Okay. I have like five minutes, I promise. Okay, 10 minutes, promise. All right, so I, I've saved all the files. So hopefully they do load for you. All right, so uh, kind of recapping, you know, JSX, it's very much like HTML, but at the end of the day, React is converting that into its, its React.create element, which at the end of the day is just JavaScript's create element. So nothing special. Um, you know, while we use it, um, one of the things that people don't like about JSX is they hate the fact that they have their JavaScript in there, their HTML in there. They might even have their CSS in there. Uh, and people don't like that because of the whole separations concerns, um, which is a valid argument. Uh, but what React is taking is that we are doing a separation of concerns where we're separating it not by te not technology, HTML versus JavaScript, but we're, we're separating our concerns on a component-based component level. So what usually happens in a React application is you'll have like that list.js element, and you'll have like a list.css with your CSS, and they'll be t you know, together. And then you may even write unit tests, and it'll have list.test.js right there. And so everything for that component is all in one spot, right side by side together. And that's how we kind of separate our concerns out in React, where um, we're breaking our component down on a component basis, not on a technology basis. Uh, this is an example of how to create um, a functional stateless component. Uh, an example that we saw about creating a stateful component, so we can actually have state, set state. We can have additional um, things going on. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about yet, and you're going to see in the next talk, is lifecycle methods. So React comes with a whole bunch of events, essentially, that happen during the lifecycle of a component, from when it's about to get rendered, to when it is rendered, to when it gets taken away. And these are very crucial for being able to do actual application work uh, in React. And there's, uh, I think there's about eight or 12 of them, uh, but I'm just going to cover, I think, four. So component did mount is probably the most important one you're going to use. You're going to use this for initializing a whole bunch of stuff when a component first loads. And more importantly, 
you're going to use this to fetch data. So this is the place where you're going to want to actually go and fetch your posts from WordPress or, or whatever REST API you're connecting to. Uh, component will receive props. Uh, so this is important if you have a component, and you're going to see this later today. Uh, if you have a component, let's say it mounts, and it's a post, and it's showing a post. And then uh, for somehow some state changes to go show another post. Well, because it's already mounted, it's not going to go and fetch or do anything new again. So this is your chance to hook in there and be like, does this post ID match this post ID? If not, we need to refetch. And so this allows you to tell an already mounted component that it needs to update itself, because it won't know inherently. It, these are functions. So you're going to get what's called next props. You're going to get what the next props are. And you can use those next props to compare to the current state to know where you're at. You'll see this later, and so it'll make more sense. But it's a very, another very useful one to know. Uh, should component update? So before a component will update when it receives new props, um, you can actually hook in and tell it not to. Uh, so React does a pretty good job of trying to figure out what should render when, but every now and then it's not right. And so you can do some performance improvements by um, if you catch some stuff that's rendering that you feel like shouldn't be rendering based on a current state change, you can tell it not to. And then another function is component will unmount. This is just helpful if, you're, if you have some like event listeners or you're hooked into some stuff, uh, you're going to want to like unregister those events or things like that, because if not, you'll have what's called like phantom views. Uh, any, any Backbone fans in the world? Phantom views, right? So uh, if you've done Backbone, phantom views is like all you ever deal with, it seems like. Um, but you'll want to un unregister from stuff, and this is a great way to do that. Uh, React DOM, we talked about that. It's a separate package, and it's what, let, it's what we use on the web to kind of inject our app into our document. Uh, we have our events and our set state, so there's just some examples there. Um, children, so you can actually, um, we didn't do this, but you can actually insert other components into parent components like this, and all you have to do is they get passed as props, and the prop it gets passed as is called children. So, so long as you render this.props.children, it'll actually output these rows that were nested inside of it. And last but not least, uh, if you want to get started in React development, don't worry about Babel or Webpack. Go get Create React App, which is the best boiler starter kind of kit that you can get. You just install this via NPM with one line of, on the command line, and you're up and running, and you'll have everything you need to start writing React on your local install. And that's it. Yes.